Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. I have been selected to speak for a group of uh, people called Scarborough Families for the Responsible Placement of Cell Towers. Members of this group who have spoken to many, many of you counselors were told a few things. Uh, let me just go through them. They were told there was no rush to enact this ordinance. They were also told that the council wants to do what's best for the entire community and make sure that this ordinance is a good one. And finally, they were told that they would have the opportunity to participate in discussions at the ordinance committee regarding any changes to the ordinance. People were told more than once and often that they would be able to participate in ordinance committee meetings, not just to stand up here for three minutes and talk. Because just standing up here and talking is not a discussion. A discussion is back and forth, questions answered, etc. So what happened at the last council meeting was very confusing and frustrating for a lot of people. It felt like the council did want to rush it. I know I've already talked to some people and some counselors, and I know that's not necessarily the case, but that's what it felt like. It also felt like there was someone or some force behind this, whether it's the telecoms or whatever, pushing it to go to the council because the council can... <clears throat> All members of the town council can participate at ordinance committee meetings. But the public can't participate at a council meeting. So why not keep it at the ordinance committee and the full council can go to the ordinance committee? This, unfortunately, is all too reminiscent of where we were two years ago prior to the last election where the two new councilors were with the animal control ordinance. As a matter of fact, it felt like the exact same thing. Boom, take it away from the public. We don't want any more public input because at the ordinance committee, any member of the full council can participate. And ordinance committees are really where you're supposed to work out the details of an ordinance. Not even in a workshop. Workshop is informational. Committee meetings are where you get the, to the meat. So anyway, it's frustrating for people to know that these council rules were broken to allow, allow the discussion of a motion to table. According to Robert's rules, that process was wrong. You should not have discussed it, and you admitted that. But then the vote was completely changed, and it was pulled from the ordinance committee, so the public has to sit here and, and comment. So I'm asking you specifically, and I asked specifically the five members of this town council who voted in the affirmative to reconsider this item, that you reconsider it tonight in good faith, because the public in good faith trusted you that you, we would be able to participate at the ordinance committee meeting. I'm asking you to reconsider this because by your rules, you can re reconsider order 1453 um, at the next meeting of the town council, which this is. And it had, um, I, I know there's going to be a workshop on October 9th, but that doesn't, um, that, that doesn't help the members of the public who really felt in faith that they were going to um, be able to talk about this and, and give input. They really felt as though the rug was pulled out from under them last meeting. So I urge you to reconsider. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Marty Tripp. I just listened to an hour of it. The site location, just like the last time I was up here, not a good idea. The idea of no, no taxes on a building that they put up someplace else, I think that's interesting, but I don't know what. The one gentleman says there's fair questions that have been asked, and a lot of fair questions are as, asked, but I didn't see enough good answers to justify an ice hockey rink. Maybe I got my problems. The traffic, they want to not have a traffic study done and come to a <coughs> referendum, a motion of referendum before you have a traffic study and know what you're doing. Then the thing tonight again was an operational board after a building board. Well, they got an operational board in Cumberland Civic Center, and they have to hand it off to a commercial outfit because they can't get it right. I got problems with that idea. But that's just one subject. My other subject is the town is up to its shoulders in debt. If you don't think you are, you're wrong. You're in the muck up to your shoulders. We have to stop doing things that are just counterproductive. 
we have to figure out how to get a little flotation device under our armpits. Yeah, we think it's funny, it's not funny, but we have to stop what we're doing and stop throwing concrete on the sidewalk and building sidewalks to nowhere. And you got to stop because if you don't stop, you're going under. And what's going to happen when you go under is you're going to pick, pick clean by those who pick corpses clean. That's all there is to it. You can't let this go any further. You've got to stop. If not, this council can stop. But the town manager and the town management and the council and the town can't stop. You're going to be picked clean. And uh, I still live here, and I don't want to see that happen. So I think you're starting to listen a little bit. You better listen more because it's not going to be pretty if you don't understand the situation completely. Get with it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Morty and I are playing a tag team every time there's a council meeting, and I apologize for that. My name is Robert Rovner. I live at 4 King Street. Um, I'm speaking tonight uh, on my own uh, as, uh, as an individual living here in Scarborough. And I, I'm, I, I, I couldn't believe half the things I heard either. There wasn't one discussion about a lease other than that maybe we're going to have a, um, a sweetheart deal going here that we're not considering. There was, no, there was nothing from the, the town council about um, fair value for the property that we are giving. Um, we understand that, that Fosh looked around and if they had to buy a place, they weren't gonna have as beautiful a building as they're thinking about having right now. Um, they might have to have a metal building that didn't have the best of, um, of locker rooms um, but they would own the property and they'd own the building. I don't understand why the town wants to get involved in this. Why do they want to be a landlord and then not charge equitable rent? I, I just don't understand it. It was brought up about the hours that the kids lose sleep. I don't know. I came from an extremely densely populated area my whole life. It's the same there. The kids, my, I had friends who live in Staten Island who had to take their kids all hours of the day and night to go play hockey. It's the same all over the country. It just isn't here. The fact that you're going to allow them to build something on the campus, it doesn't mean the kids aren't getting up any earlier or staying up any later. The place is opening up at 5.30 in the morning. Parents are still going to schlep them out of bed at 4, 4, 4.30 in the morning to get there and get dressed. Think they're not going to fall asleep in class? And then you talk about liability. It's not the same as having a football field or a basketball court or a soccer field because you own, we own, this town owns all of that. We don't own, own all of this. We own the land. They are the renters. When the kids go now and they play hockey elsewhere, who assumes the liability? We shouldn't be assuming any liability but you're opening yourself up to it. And that is a major consideration. And don't, let it, don't, don't think it's not. And the fact that the town manager thinks that this can be overcome, or that it's not a problem, and it can be worked out, it may not be able to be worked out as simply as he feels it can be. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, Dick DiBiase, uh, um, 10 Woodfield. Um, I'm in support of the ice rink, of what I heard tonight. Um, my daughter plays, my son play. Um, and I, my only, I'm not a lawyer, but it, my, I think there's also some liability about busing kids down to UNE at 5.30 on, in the morning in February. Um, there's some liability there, and that could be offset. Um, I, I also thought of some other uses for the facility. Um, I thought maybe gym classes could walk over, especially if it's exceptionally close. I think that's a, another opportunity for kids um, of a low impact, um, highly aerobic activity. Um, I also think we're living in vacation land and, and we have the beaches of Scarborough here. 
that we could offset some of our non-use in our off-season. Same thing as ski, ski uh, facilities use, they use mountain biking and road races on their ski facilities. You know, we have um, a town, you know, you can't use the beaches, but you could use an ice rink for weekend tournaments. Um, I, the Lobster Fest tournament um, in the middle of the summer is a huge, brings a lot of out-of-staters in town. They use our facilities, they use our hotel rooms, our gas stations, our Hannaford, and, and I think a, a, a couple weekend hockey tournaments, if that's a possibility, um, could bring significant uh, income. What is, I was wondering what the town council has for figures for what Lobster Fest brings to the town for tax revenue and for, um, uh, to those businesses for income. Uh, the other statistic I had was based on enriching our, our children's um, education and you know, their lives. Um, hockey uh, for, for boys is, um, if you, you can, um, it's higher than any other sport as far as, as, far as being able to play it in college. Um, for boys it is, I believe, 11%. That's higher than any other high school sport. You can play that in college. Now that doesn't mean you get into Division I school and get a free scholarship. But you, you can, it could help with admissions. For girls, it's even better. It's 22.7%. That's higher than any other high school sport we have. Um, although there's, there's fencing in there, which my daughter plays, uh, that's 38%. So, um, so there's that. So, I mean, it's better than basketball, cross country, field hockey, golf, lacrosse, skiing, soccer, swimming, tennis, track and field, volleyball, and wrestling. It's, it's stronger in all those. So that's something to consider about en enriching our students. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, close public comments. <clears throat> Minutes of September 17, 2014. Move approval. Second. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Against? None. Adjustments to the agenda. A minute this time. Okay, items to be signed. Treasurer warrants. I have them here. I'll be signing them during the meeting. Order number 14-85 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license and a liquor license from Happy Buddha, Inc. doing business as Chase uh, located at 456 Payne Road. Okay, would anybody from the public like to comment on the liquor license for Happy Buddha and Chia Sen? Anyone? Seeing none, and close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay. There's no old business at this time. Under new business, order number 1486 is act on the request to adopt the proposed Dunstan Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Plan. Okay. Tonight on this uh, order 1486, we have Karen Martin here to present the um, request. <coughs> Good evening, Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about the Dunstan Revitalization Plan. It's really been a cooperative project between the planning department and SEDCO, and I think we've um, really talked about really doing an interdisciplinary uh, program here tonight, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to why we did the plan and what we're trying to achieve. Mark Ironman with Planning Decisions is going to walk you through the plan, and then Dan's going to wrap up in case we didn't, we left something out, he's going to wrap up for us. So I really do want to start with talking about why we wanted to um, really move a Dunstan revitalization plan forward. You know, it's really the, the chance to see some opportunities that really Dan and I saw um, with respect to this really critical area within the town of Scarborough. 
And one of the things that we saw was we had this great project last year that was the Sustained Southern, Southern Maine Pilot Project. It brought a lot of community people together. They did a wonderful charrette where they looked at different possibility, possibilities. And they worked with a lot of um, the property owners in the area. And that was done last year. And one of the things that I think Dan and I were both worried about is if we let that go too long, we lose that momentum. So we really wanted to wrap up um, some of those concepts that were brought up by Sustained Southern Maine. Um, we also had this opportunity with respect to some key properties being on the market. Um, you know, those are on the market now, and we see that the economy really is beginning to pick up. We're starting to shake off some of the recession. So we felt like there was some real opportunity for us to begin to shape some of the things that may happen in Dunstan. Um, we also saw that there's the work by the Historic Preservation Committee of identifying specific properties um, in the area that they would really would like to see preserved. And we wanted to uh, figure out how to work with property owners and how to move that agenda forward as well. Plus, there's a clear policy uh, pattern, a, a clear uh, identifying of policy about Dunstan in several different works, not only the sustain. Um, Southern Maine Pilot Project, but also the Comprehensive Plan. Um, there's been a, several uh, major investments in the area, as you all know. So it's time to wrap all of this together and make sure that we, we have a, a path to move forward with respect to Dunstan. You know, and that was really it. We figured if we didn't refocus on Dunstan soon that we just lose this opportunity um, to shape what happens. And so one of the things you may be wondering is, hmm, why is SEDCO up here talking about doing a plan? Part of what we saw with Dunstan with some of the other policy documents is we really wanted to talk about um, bringing private investment to the area. And that private investment is in the form of you know, attracting different types of companies that really meet the needs of the neighborhood and meet the concepts of um, the policy documents that were already in place. And I think the other thing that SEDCO is particularly interested in um, is really this concept of public process and engagement. And one of the things that we noticed in doing, you know, really some of our meetings was this hunger for you know, more engagement in the project, in the process. And we really feel like this plan um, takes some work that's already been done and also adds this new layer of public participation and involvement. And I'm going to stop now before I waste all of our precious 15 minutes. And I'm going to let Mark Ironman walk you through the plan. And then we'll pick this back up and um, answer any questions for you. Good evening. I'm Mark Ironman from Planning Decisions. Um, I'm going to take you on a very quick tour. Uh, you all uh, got the plan as part of your packet, and I'm not going to uh, waste uh, time sort of rehashing everything that's in there, but I want to go through and sort of touch on the ha highlights. And Dan, what do I have to do to go forward? Not that. Oops. Not that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Lack of coordination here. Sorry about that. <coughs> Just press the arrow. Press the of arrow. course. <laughs> um, Karen sort of talked about why this project came about. Um, but it was really focused on the idea of how can the town, SEDCO, encourage private investment to really follow up on the substantial public investment uh, that's being made in the Dunstan area, has been made. Also, um, there are a number of the key commercial properties at Dunstan Corner that are up for sale, have the potential for redevelopment. And I think the thinking as, at the beginning of this process was sort of that the time is ripe uh, for things to happen. Oh, I did it again. I'm sorry. Dan, yeah, perhaps you could assist. <laughs> uh, this is terrible. I leaned on it. 
Okay. Um, all right. It's been a long day. I'm sorry. Um, when the strategy talks about Dunstan, it really talks about two levels, if you will. On one hand, it talks about the larger Dunstan neighborhood, really from the marsh to the turnpike, all the way from the Scarborough Saco line back up to the flats where Ann Johns is, <coughs> as the larger Dunstan neighborhood. And also, the plan looks at sort of the core, the commercial area, really from uh, where the garden center uh, used to be or will be, uh, down to the entrance uh, from Route 1 into the new development that's occurring there. The plan really does not start from a clean slate. It starts from all the work that's been done over the last 10, 11 years in, in Dunstan. Um, it starts with the vision uh, that the town developed for the entire town of Scarborough and the various villages or neighborhoods in there. That was done in 2003 and was adopted by the council. The comprehensive plan talks about Dunstan, Dunstan Corner, what should happen, and as Karen said a year ago, the Sustained Southern Maine pilot project again looked at really sort of that core area. And the plan built on those things and added an additional component of some look at neighborhood organization, how do some of these things move forward. This is the vision for Dunstan that was incorporated in the townwide vision back in 2003. And it has remained pretty consistent uh, over the last 10 or 11 years in various policy documents um, that have gone through the councils. Um, the 2006 comprehensive plan sort of elaborated on this, but the vision remains pretty much the same. Really that Dunstan is a neighborhood, a village, a mix of residential and commercial uses, that the historic elements in it are important, um, and that it really remains uh, separated from Saco. I think that's an important thing. Um, the aerial, as you look down, this is about a year old. Um, so at this point, the new Payne Road connection uh, hadn't been constructed when this aerial was taken. But again, the larger area that the strategy looks at. One of the things that was done in the process was to sit, really sit back and say both what are the opportunities for revitalization of Dunstan, what are the challenges. And these are laid out in some more detail in the strategy. But there are a number of historic properties and the potential for new investment in those, improved visual character, uh, the attraction of additional businesses, that's been a theme over the years, increased housing diversity, improved recreational facilities, while there are a number, um, the comprehensive plan talks about as residential development occurs, there may be some uh, need for additional recreational facilities. An increased sense of community, better communication, improved traffic flow. I think when we did some meetings around the strategy, there was a number of comments that in spite of <coughs> all of the investments in uh, redoing the intersections and, and making the new connection to Payne Road, uh, that there still are issues with traffic flow. Improved pedestrian bicycle facilities and enhanced public transit. And people may say, well, what does that mean? And the fact of the matter is, is that the Bitterford Saco Old Orchard Beach Bus Company actually runs a bus from Bitterford Saco to Portland six times a day, and it goes through Dunstan, and it stops in Dunstan. There are people who use it, and particularly as there's more uh, diversity of housing in the area and uh, older residents, um, that may be an opportunity. 
The strategy lays out five goals, and I'll go really quickly. Increase private investment, attract additional retail and service uses. A lot of activities really focused on what SEDCO uh, could be doing to work better and smarter to attract businesses, to develop a Dunstan-specific marketing program, to capitalize on the fact that the three-ring binder high-speed internet access, in fact, goes to the fire station, goes through Dunstan Corner, provides a really uh, locational advantage for businesses that need that sort of internet service to do a better job of packaging some of the local and regional financial and technical resources that are available, and to do that really in terms of working with the property owners to look at what could be done with buildings, what kind of development, redevelopment might occur. And secondly, to think in terms of the historic properties that are there, uh, I think, as the council is all aware, there's a process underway to uh, catalog and identify the town's historic properties. And there are some fairly lucrative state and federal rehabil tax, rehabilitation tax credits that are available uh, that are being used in other communities. A lot of what you hear about happening in Biddeford is being done through uh, historic rehabilitation tax credits and there may be the potential for some properties and property owners in Dunstan to take advantage of those. Second, to sort of create, reinforce Dunstan's identity as a place. Uh, I think when we did the neighborhood meetings, the neighborhood meeting, uh, there was um, a lot of uh, hand-wringing over the fact that when the sidewalk was built down uh, toward the marsh, uh, a number of the trees were removed, a sense that, well, is this still Dunstan? But the sense of really focusing on Dunstan as a place, um, the strategy talks about uh, involving neighborhood residents, businesses, property owners uh, in working together to try and th think through and work on some of these issues, to go back and do some things in terms of tree planting. Um, to sort of soften the effects down there, uh, create a distinctive logo that local Dunstan businesses can use, improve communication within the neighborhood, uh, both within the residential to business and within the business cr community, and to really create that southern gateway. Um, anybody who drives up Route 1 from Saco as you come through the gully at Stewart Brook and past Larry Farm, it is a break and that is an important thing and the, and the uh, plan recommends working to preserve that. The reason the strategy looks at really <clears throat> the larger area was that when the Sustained Southern Main project was done, sort of that relationship between the residential component and the business component was highlighted, that if the goal is to have local services, meat market, grocery store, what have you, you got to have people who live there who will patronize it. Uh, and so that's sort of a hand-in-glove uh, kind of relationship between the residential component and the commercial component of Dunstan. There has been quite a bit of residential growth that's been occurring, even with the recession and, and difficult housing uh, financing times, but I think focusing on increasing the amount and diversity of housing is one of the proposals. As part of the TIF that's been affordable housing TIF, there will be an affordable housing fund, some other tools that are available that developers may be able to use to assure that there's an opportunity for the private community development community to construct a variety of types of housing. Provide improved recreation facilities, and uh, I touched on that earlier. Goal four really deals with movement of people, uh, whether they're in cars, bicycles, on foot, um, 
continue to work on improving traffic flow. Um, currently, the management of the intersection still rests with the state of Maine. Uh, that will get turned over to the town at some point in the future. In terms of traffic signal timing and what have you, we heard about difficulties of people trying to come out from the beach when the campers are coming out on changeover day and one of them takes up a whole cycle of the left turn movement. Um, the idea that's back on the table uh, as a result of work by uh, the town and uh, SACO is to uh, encourage the Turnpike Authority to relook at the idea of, a, of another Turnpike interchange between the Scarborough and SACO exits to find ways to encourage people uh, rather than making the left turn into the new entrance to Payne Road to use Haggis Parkway and the improvements that were made there so that people could make a <coughs> left turn off of Route 1, um, that sort of thing. And also in there, the idea of creating a new Main Street. This is an idea that's kicked around, but really the connection between the stub end of Payne Road and Broad Turn, uh, the possibility of going back behind uh, the existing buildings. There's a fairly large amount of vacant land um, that might be able to be developed um, for a mix of uses and, and provide a center where commercial development and residential development could occur that doesn't have to rely directly on Route 1 for getting in and out. Public transit, I talked a little bit about, and there's been some discussions about uh, increasing the number of trips on the, on the bus between uh, Biddeford and Portland, and also really providing a, a designated bus stop where people can wait for the bus and use it. Finally, uh, there's already been a lot of work done in terms of sidewalks, bicycle facilities, but the issue of a better connection from Dunstan through the marsh to the Eastern Trail is there as an important one. The long-term possibility of extending sidewalk or a trail further out Broad Turn Road uh, as residential development occurs there improved pedestrian facilities within the corner itself uh, so that people who do want to try and cross the street can do it, and generally improvements to make that area more pedestrian friendly. Finally, um, the idea that this is not a one-time, one-shot project, that it's something that will be worked on uh, over time on an ongoing basis and that there should be sort of a reporting check-in requirement uh, with the council that says, okay, here's what's happened, here's how we're doing, um, what do you think? I'm going to end by saying the strategy is really the start of a process. There's been a lot of effort that's been gone into Dunstan uh, over the last 15 or 20 years. There's been a lot of money spent. Uh, this is sort of the next step to try and work with the private sector to get investment there. Uh, a key part of that is this idea of involving the neighborhood, the property owners, the residents, the businesses in coming together to work on uh, making improvements. And as Karen said in the beginning, this is really uh, pretty much being driven by SEDCO. Uh, and while some of the activities in here have planning department or town council names after them, the real driver of this process, if it's going to work, is really to create a, an agenda, if you will, for Karen and Sedco to work on to try and uh, promote development and investment in uh, the Dunstan neighborhood and that Dunstan commercial center around the Dunstan corner. That's it. Okay. I think Dan has a couple. <clears throat> yeah, Dan. Um, I don't <clears throat> have a lot to share. Uh, Karen did a nice introduction and 
and Mark um, outlined the plan and and what we heard at neighborhood meetings in the, the goals and strategies, I would just um, sort of echo Karen's introduction and say that Dunson's in a, a pretty interesting position right now. There's a lot of key properties for sale, um, so there's a lot of potential at this point. The economy is improving, so um, SEDCO and the planning department and, and our consultants think Dunson's really poised for some good things to happen. Um, so this planning effort was really trying to help facilitate those good things to happen for Dunstan um, to do, to, to help preserve those historic buildings and, and hopefully see them um, be repurposed um, and redeveloped to, to hopefully attract some small scale businesses that really fit into the fabric of Dunstan and make it more of a destination for residents uh, in town, residents in the neighborhood to, to go to for services, uh, for visitors who drive through or uh, on their way to the beaches, etc. Um, and to make sure the development that happen, happens is attractive, is of the character of Dunstan that, that fits in and <coughs> the area. So that's really the aim here is to kind of leverage all the good things that have been done in the past and um, capitalize on the potential Dunstan has. And, and we think these strategies and some additional strategies and work by the council and SEDCO and also a lot of other town committees, like the Historic Preservation Committee, like the Housing Alliance, um, like the Transportation Committee, give them some, some actions for the future to kind of help this area. So uh, with that, um, Mark and Karen and I are here for, for questions and um, want to continue the discussion, hopefully uh, gain your support for, for this plan to, to move it forward. So. Thank you. Okay, um, public comment. Would anyone like to speak to this? No one seeing none. I have a motion. Move approval. Second. Okay, council discussion. Council oh, Hope. Well, I'll jump right in. Um, you know, well, I'll be supporting this. <laughs> Let's start there. Um, Denson really is just such a unique neighborhood in itself, and in in, in this kind of stems from some of the things we've been working on. Um, I have historic preservation as a committee I'm a liaison to, as well as housing alliance, and so we in the work with those two committees, you know, it fits quite well with with what some of the you know visioning that you're talking about because these have been important points for us. Um, Dunson is certainly the area where we consider you know allowable activity to be housing and development, and 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 we don't want to lose our selves as that future come kind of unfold so this helps us kind of maintain and shape and, and have a little bit more of a, a sense of you know history that that you can bring with you as you move forward while still growing and building so um it's kind of exciting i look forward to having some hopeful well, i'm still on those committees next year um so look, look forward to you know doing some of the work with this um it's kind of like i said really exciting so Hey, it's like a management tool for growth. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Katarina. Yeah, as a member of the long-term planning committee, of course, we've been looking at this, and they've been looking at it probably longer. Than, well, I know they have longer than I've been around in the council. Um, and I agree with uh, Jessica. We need to be have a plan for developing this very important gateway area to Scarborough. Um, I'm pretty excited about some of the things that I see you know that's recommended here and I look forward to um, seeing how this pans out thank you One down here. Also Donovan. I definitely support it I think it's a unique neighborhood and we are a town of different neighborhoods uh, and that and, and and to pay attention to this one the way the planning department and SEDCO are doing it is a great service to the community. Uh, I haven't been involved in the details of it, but uh, uh, conceptually, I support it fully. Council Benedict. Um, one of the main questions that I have and that I've been asked, who's going to pay for it? Where's the money going to come from? We're already 98 million 
in <clears throat> up to in debt. Where's the money going to come from for this project? Karen. Big <laughs> 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 spender. Big spender. Let me. I'll start. Um, so. A lot of the work that we're talking about, uh, particularly with respect to attraction and the marketing piece, are already things that SEDCO does. This refocuses us. It helps us repackage. But we plan on doing this within the context of our existing budget. Where we might need additional funds, it's part of why we want so uh, much to involve the neighborhood is that I think we see that as raising funds in the private sector. If we're going to put banners up, if we're going to do um, you know, some really specific Dunstan marketing, I want to involve the businesses to try to fund that. So again, for the marketing, the attraction, um, really even some of the work that we would do trying to organize th uh, the neighborhood, I see that as being done within the existing budget. Um, I'll let you talk to the more difficult things. Right. In terms of you know, transportation improvements or things like that, there aren't, this plan doesn't make any um, short or medium term recommendations on changing the intersection or doing anything in terms of capital projects that, that take a lot of financing from the town. So um, the idea of tree plantings came up uh, given um, some tree removals in the past couple of years. You know, those are things we can do either through existing budget or we can apply for a grant funding through Project Canopy, the state program for new street trees. So uh, what's in this plan are is um, expenditures that are, like Karen said, are already within uh, the planned budgets of the town or they're really just more committee efforts, um, SEDCO efforts, planning department efforts, not capital projects that are going to cost taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Councilor Blaze. Um, I like the plan. I've got my doubts, though. Um, and the thing that I doubt the most is uh, that area of town is so jam-packed with traffic all the time, summer and winter. Um, and for it to be successful, I really feel that we got to get the, that new intersection in uh, off the uh, turnpike. And even with that, I'm not convinced that traffic is not going to be continue to be a, a problem. <coughs> and by asking businesses to come into that area with so much traffic and the ability to go left or right, um, I don't know whether it would be successful or not. But I, I kind of have my doubts on it. But I'm in favor of the, the plan. My turn? Oh. Um, Council St. Clair. Thank you. Um, I have to say that I agree with Ed. I live in that area, um, and the traffic, excuse my, my voice, um, uh, is horrendous at times, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, the idea of it, I love it. I want to see it succeed. I'm completely in favor of it. But I do have a major concern about traffic and what it's going to do to the people that already live there. Um, so that, you know, but I, but I do, I am going to see this forward. I'm excited about it. Uh, but I do, but I do have con some concerns so due to traffic. Just a couple of thoughts on traffic, not yeah. solutions per se, but a couple of thoughts. Um, one thing that was talked about during the, the planning process was, is the opportunity that traffic provides for some new investment. There's a lot of pass-through traffic um, through Dunstan right now, and there's a lot of trips and folks that are going places in Oak Hill because there aren't those places in Dunstan. So mm -hmm. um, there can be some amount of development, smaller scale development that occurs in Dunstan that isn't necessarily generating more traffic. It's actually capturing some traffic that's already going to other places that have those services. So that's that's one opportunity we see that um, is going to attract a little bit more traffic, but is actually going to maybe take trips off Route 1 and other places because people are traveling further than they do now because that service isn't provided in, du in Dunstan. Well, just even the Dunkin' Donuts that was placed <laughs> at the mobile has is jam-packed. It's shocking. I mean, mobile is quite busy normally, 
but now it's it's nuts there and I you walk in there and the line for the Dunkin Donuts and it's just this tiny little kiosk um, is around the corner of the of the mobile so it's great I mean that's an example of just one small um, piece of it so you're you're very right it's I didn't think about it like that so well, I like to say good for them they're making <laughs> money um, I think no I think this you know the traffic's going to come no matter what and the uh, um, businesses and you know are going to come so th no matter what the traffic's going to be there I, I just think it's a good idea to organize Dunstan in a way that the uh, people in Dunstan would like to see it the, the in the their vision of how it should be because growth's coming no matter what and the better we organize it to the liking of the uh, Dunstan neighborhood um, down there trying to stick with some tradition I think is a excellent thing so I'm all for this and um, with that was there any other council comment oh of course council all right, all right. Um, I, I just kind of want to piggyback on, on a com you know kind of like the Dunkin Donuts comment where it's maybe not sending somebody out of their way to go there but somebody who was already driving past there now stops there um, <laughs> I drive past it every, you know, twice a day. Um, it, that, that's more to the kind of the point and the principle, at least that's what I take away from it, um, especially with some of the, you know, historic preservation work that we've talked about. Growth and change does happen. Mm -hmm. um, so the likelihood, if, if we do nothing and, and we try to have, you know, no focus and no preference and, and no, you know, growth or planning, you know, towards that area, you would lose something like, say, the Dunstan School which, you know, let's face it, that's route one, prime real estate. So if we maybe have a little more wiggle room and opportunity for that building, and it's, a, say, a small grocer, you're probably not attracting, you know, it's not, it's not a market basket, no, no offense, but um, not that there's any sales pitch there, but it, it, it doesn't have the draw. The, the person that's going to utilize that in a small grocery setting is somebody in that neighborhood. I only need one or two things. I don't need eight different varieties of it. I just want a roll of toilet paper. So that, that's kind of, you know, the, the, the concepts behind this. It's what do we have there that's already there and unique? And maybe if we're a little less picky as we can be known to be with our building codes and some of our things and if we make it easier for for businesses to be there and, and to attract them and make it worthwhile for them um, to come in that that we could keep some of that uniqueness so that to me is more of the goal of, of some of these initiatives so, hope that helps okay. council benedict I think the one thing that needs to have a little more work, or a lot more work on it, is the traffic situation. I live there too. I live off of Broad Street, <coughs> and I am through that intersection. I can be through it up to eight times a day. And it's no good time to go through there. None. If I have to go, and I can get there from going down my street and going down 22, and come back in around the other way and I'll do it. To go to Saco, you won't find me on Route 1 almost at any particular time. I don't think, I think the summer is worse, but worse than what? It's always worse. It's always bad. And I'm all for the project. I think that's terrific. But I think that the traffic has really got to be a point that's going to be deterred, slow down, whatever. I know progress isn't going to be stopped by us, but we've got to fix that problem before we worry about the other things. <clears throat> it's horrendous, and the, 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 the work that was done there before in the last two or three years did not really improve anything. As a resident and transportation, 
it's no better. If anything, it's worth worse, especially that left turn on the Payne Road. That is just a nightmare, especially in the summer when you got somebody coming out of Pine Point Road and they want to get on Payne Road. They got no idea how to do it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, with that being said, um, all those in favor? Unanimous. Order number 14-87 is act to set the date, time, and location of the municipal elections for Tuesday, November 4th, 2014. Appoint the warden, set the hours for voter registration, and act on appointments of election and ballot pursuant to Chapter 200 of the Town Charter, Article 8, Nomination and Elections, and authorize the town clerk to make any additional appointments as necessary. The warden will be Guy Gledhill. Deputy Warden will be William Pennell. Would anybody from the public like to comment on Order 1487? Seeing none, motion. Move approval. Second. Good. Discussion. Comments. Get out and vote. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> absentee. All, oh, Actually, absentee sorry, ballots will be no available on Monday. Yeah. Monday, absentee ballots. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Non action items. Standing committees and liaison reports. We'll start with Council of St. Clair. Um, the only thing I have is the Ordinance Committee is meeting October 15th at 2 p.m. Okay. Council Blaze. Um, I'd just like to make one comment. Uh, I, I attended a SEDCO board meeting a couple weeks ago, and I'd just like to commend Karen Martin. For the outstanding job that she did right after the fire mm. yeah. um, I think she was there probably 10 minutes after the alarm went off <laughs> what I understand but I've gotten feedback from a number of businesses oh. yeah they said that she did an incredible job um, and I just want to thank Karen very much I really really appreciate it I started with the businesses yeah <laughs> Councillor Benedict. I have nothing. Okay. Councillor Katerina. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, tomorrow I will be going to Augusta for the first uh, Maine Municipal Association Legislative Council meeting where we'll be starting to determine what our legislative agenda will be and how we will be working with the legislature uh, in this upcoming session. And I will obviously keep you guys informed as to, you know, what's what and what our priorities and whatever will be. Um, also, I think this will be the place to put it. I had a meeting, um, well, in the last couple weeks, days just fly by here on me. Um, I've asked um, our town manager, Tom Hall, and, I, and we met with, with Karen Martin from SEDCO, the IT and planning. How... Can we use fiber optics in this town? We have the three ring binder going through town. South Portland's jumping on it. Other people are jumping in on the bandwagon. So I've, I have sort of taken the bull by the horn and, and asked us as a town to start looking at what makes sense for us, particularly from an economic development point of view, uh, for using fiber optics. Uh, and I'm learning a lot in one meeting already. So uh, that's something that um, I've started uh, and long-term planning is meeting Friday morning at 8 a.m. and we're going to be looking at uh, what do we want to do with Higgins Beach and Pine Point if any of you who live there I'm looking at a couple of people <laughs> want to come by that's it for me thank you Councillor Donovan uh, I attended the uh, CITCO meeting uh, with Councillor Blaze as the uh, counselor uh, liaisons and uh, uh, echo his praise for Karen Martin uh, uh, the day before the meeting and I told the people who attended the meeting this little story a, a friend of mine from uh, South Portland who uh, uh, gets her hair done at one of the facilities there that was burned out uh, she had just come from the new facility, which was temporary in nature, and they said they were all 
in tears telling the story about how uh, incredible it was, the effort by Sedco and Karen Martin to, uh, to find them space and get up and running in a matter of days. And they said it was, and this person just wanted to call me to say the town should be rightly proud. Thank you. Councillor Holbrook. Um, so a couple things. Um, the first one is with historic preservation. Um, we are at the point where um, we are working on owner outreach. So there is um, some mailing that has gone out. There'll be several stages, but um, anything that's potentially on the, the list that we're looking at as a being identified as having some kind of historic significance. Um, if you have not received a letter yet as a property owner, you probably will shortly, um, as well as owners of, you know, monuments, sites, cemeteries. Um, um, you know, we're trying to keep it as broad as we can to, to bring in as much owner feedback as we can. Um, that meeting will be Tuesday, October 21st at 6.30 p.m. in Council Chambers. I also just wanted to take a quick moment to let um, folks know that it's not solely just a property owner's meeting, although that was a good place to kind of start to try to engage conversations and see what might be helpful to them and to get some feedback. Um, it is an open meeting, so certainly if you have an interest in um, history and, and preservation and have maybe concepts and ideas, it is an open meeting. Welcome to attend, um, and we'd love to hear from you. And um, the next historic preservation meeting will be next Tuesday. That's their regular meeting, um, and they'll be working through some, some regular tasks. But again, the owner's meeting will be October 21st at 6.30 p.m. Um, as, as well on the lines of Historic Preservation Committee, the Hunnewell House is, I believe, officially done as far as work. Um, there were some kind of unfortunate circumstances with the Hunnewell House that it had been forgotten a little bit. And so um, there was a number of steps. There was, um, as you may recall, they removed some of the moss growing on the, the roof. They did some tree removal. <clears throat> there was a vapor barrier installed underneath the building to help with the moisture problems. And then the last task being air vents were installed mm -hmm. this week um, so that the building now breathes so air should circulate and flow a lot better. Um, the bad news. On a recent tour, the powder post beetle is not gone and mm. will need to be retreated this spring. So um, there's yeah. the bad news. <laughs> um, however, there is some good news. We, we do have some success. Um, we did reach out. Um, um, Bruce Grelifer was great and reached out through um, community services to the seniors programming to ask if there was any interest or some volunteers to help with an effort that Preservation um, Committee is exploring on um, one of the, the biggest things that we've come back to, and it was a suggestion, is the Hanawal House is never open. Hmm. So we're exploring the opportunities of using some kind of a volunteer base to hopefully, hmm. um, the, the target would be Memorial Weekend, um, try to be in tandem with the parade and some of the activities the town already does. Um, and we, we have had some success in finding volunteers hmm. interested to help with that. Um, and my next thing would be um, Housing Alliance. They will be meeting this Thursday at 6.30. Um, there are several things kind of in the pipes coming for um, the Housing Alliance. There's, um, trying to think where to even start with that. Um, it's come to my attention that it is entirely possible that Scarborough is perhaps not in line with some of the state statutes and goals for growth management and as it relates to housing. So um, the next meeting, like I said, will be this Thursday and, and we'll be starting the process of more or less putting together all the information of what the town currently has for, for housing and housing stock and initiatives and um, looking at that and comparing it to some of, like I said, the Growth Management Act and some of the land and use planning um, and, and trying to start working through figuring out where Scarborough stands with that and where to move forward. Um, and then that's it. That's it for liaison. Okay, thank you. Um, I had no committees to report on. 
So with that, we'll just go to the town manager's report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. I, I guess it's the night to uh, heap praise. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm seeing something from the front <laughs> row. Uh, <laughs> I, I, too, uh, I was remiss last meeting, you might recall. It was a late evening. I, uh, I uh, deferred my time to this evening. Uh, but in doing so, I was remiss in recognizing the, the really great effort um, at the Scarborough Commons fire. I happened uh, to be called that night and went to the scene and actually texted Karen from the scene and I said we absolutely need to do something and I didn't have to say another word. Uh, the next morning things were mobilized. Nancy Kroll, the library director, was there assisting Karen and meeting with folks, understanding their needs and Karen went to work uh, really finding them temporary housing. The other piece that I just want to relate is the tremendous mutual aid at that scene. Mm, yeah. uh, I arrived on the scene and there were four ladder trucks, one of them ours. Uh, all flowing water, doing a terrific job just keeping that scene uh, under control. And it was really uh, quite comforting to know that we've got that sort of support when we need it. Uh, a couple other points of interest. Uh, the Benjamin Farm Project is um, very pleased to report their fundraising efforts are uh, going along very nicely. In fact, they have exceeded their $400,000 at this point. Wow. The final uh, $100,000 uh, to get to their ultimate goal uh, there's a challenge grant that's out there, and I believe that they're quite confident that, that will get them to their goal by the end of the year, which is uh, a tremendous feat, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also <clears throat> starting to talk about the whole stewardship aspect of that property and others, which I think is, um, is an important part of this. We have essentially a thousand acres uh, conserved. Some of it is, uh, is available to, for public access. All of it is, but uh, we need to do a better job of of really opening up those public lands for use. And uh, we'll do our part to help them in that stewardship. I'm pleased to report the dredge project has, uh, is back on track. A new contract has been awarded. Uh, coincidentally, it's uh, back to the same company that did it last time in 2004, a company that we're familiar with, very confident in their abilities. And to that end, there's a pre-construction meeting next Thursday here at Town Hall. And I fully expect they'll be mobilized and, and uh, underway in early November, as soon as the uh, permits allow. So we're very, very pleased with that. I also want to mention Mike Shaw and his staff at Public Works uh, put in a 10-space parking lot. Uh, this is off Eastern Road mm -hmm. to service the Eastern Trail. And this is on land that was uh, still owned by the Sanitary District. We did negotiate or receive an easement to, to do this. Uh, and we're now in conversation with IFNW, who actually owns Eastern Road, about what we can do uh, with restricting the on-street parking uh, or somehow coordinating it uh, in a better fashion. Today, there's no restrictions, and people park where they will, essentially. So I hope to report more on that in the future. Uh, as regards the Habitat project, a couple of monumental things happened this week. Uh, Habitat exercised their option on the land, meaning that they took the final step, uh, sh closing is the only thing remaining, to purchase the land, which is an extremely good step, obviously. And the town also uh, awarded sewer bids. This is for the grant-supported sewer extension from the pump station up to the project. And uh, that work, I believe, in negotiations with the contractor who's grounding construction, uh, that, that work will likely be deferred to the spring, which actually will work better in coordination with the site work. Um, we believe Grandin will be doing the site work for Habitat as well, so keeping that all together makes a lot of sense. Two final pet matters uh, as regards the whole cellular tower discussion. Um, Dan Bacon and myself and, and uh, a couple of members of council have been putting together some final details, some information uh, that we think the public will be very interested in seeing, uh, and I s s expect and hope will be the subject of the discussion next Thursday evening at the workshop. Uh, that material will be available on the web first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I encourage folks to look at that. Staff's <clears throat> available to help um, describe what you're seeing there and be of any assistance we can. So on that score, uh, again, there's a workshop for next Thursday here in these chambers, and then the matter will be back on the council agenda on the 15th. So that's kind of what we're steering toward. And lastly, there is a open house and ribbon cutting for the new Wentworth Intermediate School. It's Saturday, October 18 at 1 in the afternoon. And I know the number of members of council are interested in seeing the tour. 
Uh, that's an opportunity, and we still have an open invitation to organize something special for the council if that's something you wish to do. Um, yes, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I said that loudly. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you heard me. I heard. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pleased to coordinate that, and I'll work with the chairman yeah. on finding a time. Thank you. Time. So thank you very much. Said go in. Oh, and there is a SEDCO <laughs> annual meeting uh, next Tuesday, Tuesday evening, 5.30 at the Black Point Inn. And the speaker this year is Mark Basir. He's the uh, president or executive director of the Portland Museum of Art. So we're very excited. There's some interesting things that have happened with the preservation of the Winslow Homer House, uh, also on Proud Snack. So there's some um, interesting things going on, and Black Point Inn is always a very nice venue. Okay, with that, Councilor Member Comments, Councilor Holbrook. I, due to time constraints, left all my notes at home, so I will be doing them next time. Oh, my. <laughs> hey, Councilor Don. <Donner. clears throat> uh, uh, speaking with the business manager for Protestant Country Club, uh, uh, she spoke very highly of... Uh, the people who did the dredge in 2004, and I know they'll be very pleased uh, to learn that uh, that's the same company that will be doing. They, she, she said they did an exceptional job, and so I think the uh, harbor uh, within uh, six weeks is probably the job is going to get yeah. done and get done well. So that was good news. Uh, <clears throat> on the the rink, uh, I really. Uh, appreciate the, the chair holding a workshop because uh, uh, it really gives us a chance to express how we feel and I and I'm hoping that uh, the town manager and the chair can take away the concerns that were expressed and <clears throat> we can really move forward <clears throat> with a plan I think that um, all of the concerns have solutions but there's a lot of work to be done to achieve that <clears throat> and so uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't know whether or not uh, any time is available on the 9th to uh, 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 further advance that discussion, but uh, I think it's, uh, the more we talk about it, the more we understand what each other really feels are the, the factors that are the limiting factors, the factors that need to be addressed. And so uh, I'd be certainly in favor of of doing that <clears throat> in advance of the 15th when it's back on the agenda. So, mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Caterina. Um, yeah, um, this, the Eastern Trail, I happen to be walking there today, and just so the manager will know, I didn't even see that new parking lot until I had already parked. So, the signage is a little tiny, but that may be just me. But just so you'll know. <laughs> um, also, um, I'm glad that we're doing more workshops. I think it's very helpful for the public to see what our thinking process is, hear the questions, and the public is always welcome after workshops to come up and make comments. And we do have emails. And I think that new Google email seems to be working well because we received probably 50 emails regarding yeah. the hockey rink through the Google so people don't have to remember how to spell Katarina or, you know, whatever. Um, and the CI dot Scarborough, I can't remember it. So anyway, so I'm glad to see that. Um, regarding the cell tower issue, uh, I'm a little disappointed to hear that people feel like they haven't been heard or that there's something going on behind the scenes because I think that's a bit disingenuous. Um, I did some research, and the issue's been on the ordinance calendar since March 26th of 2013. Uh, there were several meetings about it throughout the summer of 2013, <coughs> and actually a couple of the people who are involved with the cell tower issue and have concerns about it were actually at one or two of those meetings on other things. So anyway, it's just a little discouraging because we are going to do the workshop, and, you know, there's plenty of time for people, if they've got anything new to bring up, bring it up. But I haven't seen anything new, and I've a I asked a couple people who approached me about, can we table this? 
Uh, excuse me, can we uh, re-vote on the, on the table in which I don't think is allowed under Robert's rules anyway, but I could be wrong, um, is do you have something new that we haven't heard before? And I, no, I mean, so anyway, that's it for tonight. Thank you. Councillor Benedict, comments? <coughs> Excuse me. I wanted to commend the high school uh, for last Friday with their raising, raising the food and money mm. for the food bank and getting up and being at the high school at 5 o'clock in the morning. I watched those things all last year, and it looked to me like one of the better well uh, attended by all good representation yeah. from the lower grades right up to the senior grades. Mm -hmm. And I think they did an excellent job, and I didn't want it to go <clears throat> under the bridge. Um, that's all I have to say for tonight. Thank you. Council Blaze. Uh, I'd just like to say something about the cell tower issue. Uh, yes, it's been on agendas for a long time, but every time you turn around, there's something new. And every time there's something new, the, the public has got the right to talk about it and not just get up and give their opinion, but to discuss it. And by taking it away from the ordinance committee, we're removing that. Um, so my advice is that we move very, very slowly on this. There's no rush. I don't see people banging at our doors trying to put towers up. So we've got to take our time and make sure that we get this correct. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Councilor Sinclair. Thank you. Um, I, I know that um, I missed the meeting two weeks ago. Um, I know that that was, um, unfortunately, I am the chair of the ordinance committee, and I think maybe things might have gone a little bit differently if I had been able to explain um, my feelings on some of that. I think the reason that the, there are some people in the public that are having issue with how things were handled or, or, or feel like they're not being heard was because was because I have said numerous times personally, it's going to go to ordinance, you'll have time, we're handling this differently, and I've, repeat, and I've said that over and over, so I think that's why there's a public outcry at this point, because it, I've said that numerous times. Um, I'm hopeful that um, we do take it slowly. Like um, Councillor Blaze has said, there. I have actually seen new information, so I, I, um, I think you know we're all dealing with the same people. So um, hopefully that we can all share that before our um, our workshop. Uh, I'm disappointed that it's not um, going to be before um, the ordinance committee because I do think we have more. We can have more of a um, conversation there. Um, and all counselors are always allowed to be there and can speak there. Um, but other than that, um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, as far as the uh, the October 9th workshop um, on the cell phone towers, seven o'clock. Um, we'll have uh, where there's no council meeting. We'll have input from the public, and. Um, and what they have to say on the new um, uh, additions to um, protect Scarborough citizens on the cell phone tower, make it, and it's a lot stricter than when it came out of ordinance. Um, amendments have been made by <laughs> this council, and um, I, my opinion is this council on a whole should weigh in on this matter and talk amongst each other. Um, I know myself, I've um, met with um, members of the Pleasant Hill community uh, and listened to their concerns along with others here sitting at this council. So, um, you know, it, 
uh, it makes for a good dialogue, uh, I believe a better dialogue than it would at ordinance uh, during, this is going to be at night, 7 o'clock at night, it it's, won't be during the day when the public, most of the public is unable to attend. So this is why I thought all along it would be better to workshop this in front of the council and at 7 o'clock at night and people can weigh in on it. Um, I love how people uh, will say that there's been conspiracy theories, false allegations made. The truth of the matter is this was in ordinance for well over 12 months. It went, that's quite a while for an ordinance. It was in all the local papers and uh, it was well publicized. Whether the the public was kept from coming to the meetings because of the uh, one o'clock time, uh, I don't know. But as soon as it came to the council, uh, the public showed up and voiced their opinions and concerns and we listened. Since I um, became chair of this council, each and every time we've had an issue, a hot button issue, I've met with people from the public, uh, listened to their concerns, and we went back and looked at what we had drafted. And I'm not the only one. There's other councils here that every hot issue that we've had, we've met with public. That's new. I asked the people out there in the ordinance, uh, out there in the audience, uh, sitting at home, have you ever seen this many workshops in a year? We're trying our best to be open to the public and uh, listen to what their concerns are and, and uh, air this in front of the public. So we're better transparent, um, and uh, we'll we'll work on doing better. Um, we have been. This is a step, I think, in the right direction, as far as transparency goes. Um, so, with that being said, order number fourteen. Oh, just one, no, one no, I wanted to Sorry. say one more thing, and then we'll move right along. Uh, I wanted to talk about the fire. Um, I want to commend all the firemen that were there. Uh, Scarborough, uh, South Portland, Portland, and any other communities that I left out. They did a great job. That was a heck of a stop. Um, that building had a, had a heavy, heavy fire load. Mm -hmm. And to control that kind of a fire load, talking from experience, that, that's, that was a good stop, even though there was probably the building was a total loss. But good job. And uh, I forgot to mention that at the last meeting. And uh, I sent a email right out uh, apologizing to Chief Thurlow and telling him to pass it on to his fellow firefighters of what a great job I thought they did from a professional perspective. Um, I also want to thank Karen Martin um, for the fine job she did, once again, uh, placing the businesses being right there. Um, Tom Hall's a town manager uh, showing up uh, to some uh, uh, big devastating uh, event like that in town that that's that shows that uh, there's we have a lot of people in this community that really care mm -hmm. and I'm proud so now with that being said sorry 14-88 is act on the request for an executive session pursuant to title one of the main revised statute subsection 4056 D in consultation with legal counsel regarding pending litigation do I have a motion Approval. Second. All those in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Let me go to the conference room. You should be quick. 